ago. And I moved from Ulich 26 years ago. Why did you apologize? The ICTP has its own database. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I went there, I corrected it before the conference, but it's still there, so it's. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, just to, to make sure. Uh, I'm at the Karlsruhe University Institute of Technology, and that's uh, where I've been uh, for already almost uh, 13 years, or 14 years. So, and I would like to present the work uh, done by a very talented young uh, PhD student, Jan Brem, <coughs> who graduated uh, uh, actually last year. And uh, it will be about um, uh, arrays of uh, superconducting qubits uh, in a waveguide. So, uh, the uh, attitude uh, to look at this uh, is maybe, can be uh, various, but uh, we like to look at it as uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of artificial medium made of uh, something which behaves as a um, certain um, kind of material with particular properties for propagating electromagnetic waves. So if uh, one takes uh, uh, a material and eliminates with uh, electromagnetic waves, then and the limit that the distance between atoms is uh, much smaller than the wavelengths, the medium behaves uh, with its uh, characteristic uh, dielectric uh, constant and uh, magnetic permeability, and that actually defines the penetration of, uh, of light or waves uh, through this material. And already more than 20 years ago, there was a uh, kind of idea proposed by mostly by electrical engineers uh, that uh, one can actually design uh, artificial uh, medium made of out of uh, identical small elements, much smaller than the wavelengths, which at certain frequency will have some peculiar properties. And uh, one of those uh, driving ideas was actually to implement a negative epsilon mu, a particular frequency which actually uh, has a lot of uh, interest at that time. Um, however, uh, if one goes this path, which was uh, uh, originally proposed in this paper, um, uh, here, uh, like using the uh, uh, split ring resonators, uh, which were smaller than the wavelengths, but almost comparable. Uh, by introducing the uh, uh, superconductor, one wins here uh, frequency tunability, and actually also very low loss, and we have done over um, past uh, uh, 10 years or so experiments with classical superconducting circuits, uh, like squids, uh, which interact with electromagnetic waves, and which, can be, uh, which properties can be tuned by um, magnetic field. So you can tune the frequency by changing the Josephson inductance through the current which is flowing in the ring. But most interesting, of course, is to use the, the capacity of uh, superconducting um, circuits uh, such that um, the, uh, the circuits really behave as quantum systems. So now one can actually make a medium consisting of um, artificial atoms, which uh, could be made much smaller than the wavelengths, and then uh, they will uh, show pristine quantum properties. And the first paper uh, which we had on that was already almost um, a decade uh, back. Uh, this is a paper by Pascal Maha uh, in collaboration with um, the Institute of Photonic Technologies in Vienna, where we actually studied the array of qubits uh, in the waveguide. So uh, the artificial atoms which we, uh, we like to take uh, are not just uh, harmonic oscillators, as, uh, as we have seen uh, in this classical um, kind of um, prototypes. But uh, really, uh, the uh, um, elements which, are, which have been uh, talked about uh, um, very um, often in this conference, these are transmond qubits, which uh, are basically uh, Josephson junctions shunted by capacitance. And these transmond qubits, uh, they have slightly unharmonic potential. Therefore, one can um, couple by electromagnetic um, irradiation the uh, ground state in the first excited state. And if the driving is not too hard, actually avoid excitation to higher levels. So one can really uh, work with them as, as real uh, uh, true two-level systems. Uh, the device which we, we take is a, um, a transmon in this most uh, um, kind of beloved configuration with this um, interdigitated capacitor. So you see here, this is the transmission line um, um, going in, uh, in this, that, that was where the waves propagate. And this is the device, uh, which consists of two large superconducting electrodes forming large capacitance. And then uh, trans one itself is a, a squid, uh, which uh, actually uh, allows us to tune the Josephson um, energy uh, of the device uh, by changing the frequency of the transition between the ground state and the first excited state in the range between three and uh, to eight uh, gigahertz. 
And uh, as uh, you have heard already in this meeting that uh, these devices are uh, uh, weakly unharmonic. So the harmonicity in our particular devices is, is in the range of uh, 300 uh, megahertz. And it's actually, of course, negative because of the soft potential, uh, which we have seen on the previous slide. So um, as I mentioned, uh, there have been a number of uh, papers. Uh, I forgot to update this slide to put some reference here, but uh, uh, never mind, it's easy to find. So basically, uh, they, 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 there would be a number of experiments of um, uh, arrays of uh, superconducting qubits placed uh, in, in a, a cavity. And in this case, uh, one can show um, uh, Tavis Cummings Hamiltonian um, behavior, uh, one can show collective coupling and coupling to the single mode of um, uh, kind of collective uh, excitation in the, um, in the system. Uh, in uh, my talk today, I'm going to speak about arrays uh, really placed uh, in a, a one-dimensional space in transmission line or, or one-dimensional waveguide. And uh, here uh, you see a picture of our uh, sample holder. So basically the, the whole device is uh, quite small. It's uh, like five to 10 or five to eight millimeter device, which is placed in a um, microwave um, sample holder where we could measure the transmission or reflection from a circuit at microwave frequencies. Now, if you take array of qubits, arrays of qubits, there have been a number of uh, theoretical works uh, predicting various interesting effects. And between them, uh, just to name a few, were uh, super and subradiance. Um, there, there was an old proposal already before first experiments started about band gap engineering. That's something I'm going to touch today. Uh, one can uh, use a device for uh, quantum memory, and that's what I'm also going to, going to mention today, uh, to generate uh, non-classical light. That's something which is still uh, uh, kind of uh, open field, not many experiments done there. Uh, one can do lasing, one can do uh, single photon detection, uh, and so forth. So um, the major experimental challenge here is really to make uh, the uh, artificial atoms as nice as natural atoms, and uh, uh, the difficulty is that you can never make them identical. So they are, of course, uh, by technology, they will be uh, slightly different, and that means uh, there will be some spread of frequencies of these artificial atoms, which really make them being uh, uh, distinctly different from their natural prototypes. So um, considering an array of qubits uh, placed in the waveguide, one can write this Hamiltonian, where you see the uh, Hamiltonian of qubits summed over all the qubits. Here, one can see uh, here the uh, uh, waves propagating in the waveguide. This is this term, and then there is a coupling term, dipole-like coupling between uh, those, those um, propagating waves and, and qubits. And uh, uh, they have been shown by uh, several theoretical groups so that uh, it's uh, kind of uh, instructive to um, integrate out uh, photonic degrees of freedom. And uh, then the effective Hamiltonian becomes the, uh, uh, the qubit Hamiltonian, uh, consisting of these two terms, and then there will be uh, infinite range interaction uh, between qubits uh, given by the last term. Now this um, infinite range interaction um, 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 mediated by photons uh, comes in two flavors. Uh, first is the uh, uh, flavor, it has a complex and, and um, um, character and um, imaginary and real part. And uh, uh, one flavor is a collective decay, which uh, depends on the cosine of a distance between the qubits. So this is the, uh, this gamma uh, uh, j, uh, ij. And the second is the exchange interaction, uh, which is proportional to the sign. So um, basically by changing the distance between the qubits, one can uh, uh, modify uh, those, uh, those two types of uh, um, um, features. And uh, the decay, of course, uh, means that there will be uh, um, enhanced uh, probability of uh, losing the photons in the, in the waveguide due to the collective interaction between the qubits and the, um, the propagating photons. So um, when uh, one takes the um, single photon manifold and diagonalizes uh, the Hamiltonian, then one gets uh, uh, eigenmodes uh, for, this, um, for this Hamiltonian. And uh, there are um, uh, so-called superradiant modes, which uh, are characterized by enhanced decay, so that um, basically the imaginary part uh, of those eigenmodes is larger than uh, the uh, um, decay of individual qubits, so it's the decay uh, quicker. And there are also subradiant modes which actually don't want to decay, but of course in, the, in, in this case the, um, the um, 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 decay uh, characteristic is limited by the uh, uh, intrinsic loss, basically, the loss which is not the radiative radiation in the, in the waveguide, but rather some intrinsic loss uh, in the qubits themselves. 
And uh, one can see that actually on this plot, um, the color shows the imaginary part of the um, um, of those modes and the vertical axis shows the real part. So if one increases the number of qubits, then uh, there is a formation of a band gap um, between the super radiant mode, which is the upper one, and the uh, um, variety of the sub radiant modes, which are the low ones, uh, which in the limit of a uh, uh, very large number of qubits becomes really uh, a gap. And there are uh, uh, these uh, polyritonic um, branches one uh, limited by the upper uh, range of the gap and the other one is limited by the lower um, boundary of the gap. And here in the gap, basically the uh, radiation from the uh, array of qubits is being reflected back uh, uh, in the, uh, the waveguide. So um, all these, uh, these modes actually are characterized by this polyritonic type uh, excitations uh, of these artificial atoms uh, interacting with uh, one dimensional electromagnetic waves propagating in the waveguide. So um, just uh, without really uh, thinking much, one can place a lot of qubits on the chip and then uh, do something with them. And that's what we have uh, uh, done uh, immediately. We, we, we thought would be what we should perhaps uh, see something. So um, Jan made a great effort of making really nearly identical qubits here, uh, at least to, to the perfection he could do. But still, there was, of course, spread of frequencies in this large array. So here you see 90 qubits placed in one dimensional waveguide. We apply microwave from here and we take the microwave out. Basically, we measure the transmission. And uh, in this particular case, um, we, we coupled, uh, in this first experiment, we coupled the qubits uh, very strongly to the waveguide. So the, um, the decay uh, was uh, very um, large. So the T1 time was limited basically by this radiation in one dimensional waveguide. And uh, T2 was uh, T1 limited, of course, in this case. So uh, basically just trying to look if we could see a signature of these qubits um, acting together. And uh, the prediction that, uh, from, from the model um, was that uh, we should have a band gap at some frequency here. But of course, we, if you take the spread of frequencies of qubits, then we get these gray curves. These are some random, uh, uh, randomly chosen configuration of disorder in the array, uh, which we just wanted to have a look in this, in this simulation. And the experiment uh, shows indeed um, uh, a band gap, which we see here at about five gigahertz. Uh, so this is the band gap. Um, the blue uh, range is the way the transmission uh, is, um, is very low. Basically, the waves get reflected from the array. And the signature of uh, two-level behavior is that there is a saturation here um, at a particular power. And if you uh, can uh, take uh, some of the lines which we see there as single qubits, which are often frequency from this uh, large array of, of, of qubits, uh, then the saturation for them was around um, uh, minus uh, 120 dBm, whereas the saturation for the large array uh, was uh, actually at a power about uh, 18 to 20 qubits higher. So from that we could estimate that uh, actually this band gap, uh, uh, which of course has some sp spread of frequencies um, inside it, uh, there, are, there is about 60, 70 qubits participating. But as we cannot control really the, we cannot make qubits identical, we cannot control their frequencies. So of course, it's not really much what we could do with that. You could sort of have a look and, and uh, get an idea, but um, you cannot really uh, do some um, fine tuning and, and uh, uh, clever experiments with that. So this actually brought us to, to the point that we decided really to make uh, the whole array tunable. Um, Basically, we need to change the frequencies of all these artificial atoms, and doing this uh, uh, in experiment requires, of course, uh, um, uh, eight controls, or if you want to go more, it's possible, but it really becomes a really bulky, uh, bulky experiment. So we, we decided just to take eight qubits, and this is our sample here. Uh, again, uh, similar geometry as before. Um, we have chosen the distance between qubits to be of the order of um, uh, 400 microns, which actually corresponds to the intercubit distance at the frequency of the resonances being smaller than the, uh, the wavelengths. So we are in the metamaterial limit, uh, uh, such that actually the qubits are pretty close uh, together, but of course they, they occupy a certain fraction of a wavelength um, in the waveguide. And um, um, as, uh, uh, as you see here, all the qubits, in contrast to the previous picture, they have now this control line, which you see here. So basically we could run the current through each qubit, um, problem with this pointer. Uh, we run the current through the, each qubit here, through this line, okay? And uh, this changes the flux in this loop. So basically we could individually control um, the frequency of, of uh, every qubit in this uh, eight qubit array. 
So um, first thing to, to do is to characterize uh, individual qubits. So and here we uh, tune seven qubits away, put at the frequency of our interest, which was around eight gigahertz, 7.88 gigahertz, a single qubit, and then measure the uh, transmission through this array. We measure this coefficient S to one. And uh, as uh, uh, was uh, observed uh, in um, pioneering work of uh, uh, Alek Astafiev, uh, that time at NEC and followed also by, by other uh, studies, in particular in Chalmers. Uh, there, um, this array shows, or the single qubit shows uh, resonant fluorescence. Basically, if a photon propagates in a waveguide uh, and this photon is resonant with the transition between the ground state and the first excited state, the qubit gets excited and then re emits the photon back into the waveguide with opposite phase. So basically, the photon gets 100% reflection probability from the qubit. And in this case, uh, this is characterized by uh, the um, uh, figure of merit, which is called extinction. So basically, it's a ratio of, the, um, uh, of, the, of this full transmission. Um, uh, it's, actually, it's actually a ratio of the full transmission uh, to um, the transmission at the, at the um, qubit frequency. And you see, it in our case, it's, it's really high. It's about 99%. So again, the uh, qubit was very strongly coupled. Uh, the reason is the qubit is very strongly coupled to one dimensional waveguide. Its uh, coherence times T1 is radiation limited is about 25 uh, nanoseconds and uh, uh, the corresponding uh, T2-like time, which is the uh, dephasing, uh, um, is uh, estimated from this uh, circle fit uh, is about um, uh, twice uh, larger. So um, this is the, uh, the thing which has been already uh, shown for individual qubits. So let's see what, uh, what taking more qubits brings to that. So uh, now what we do, we tune one by one qubits to the resonance of, the, of the, the first qubit, which is already sitting there. So when we put two qubits at the resonance and the other six qubits are away, we see that actually the lines modifies such that we observe uh, this uh, uh, quite um, non-monotonic um, um, actually not symmetric uh, Lorentzian, and you see this little uh, peak which is, uh, which is arising on the left of the main minimum. If you bring more qubits to the resonance, then you see this peak becomes uh, quite clear, it's a pretty sharp feature. And then if you bring four, it really grows up. And if you bring all eight qubits, then what you observe is that actually um, there is a, a wide gap here on the right. And then uh, there is, there is this, this peak, and then also the appearance of a uh, precursor of the additional peak, which actually the dark tux states. So the appearance of this, uh, this band gap is actually a signature of the bright state, but up, uh, on the side of the bright state, you see also uh, the appearance of these uh, dark states. And it's a bit more convenient to measure this, uh, not in transmission, but in reflection. And uh, that's what next picture shows. So this is now eight qubits um, measured in the uh, uh, in transmission, and this is their uh, measurements in the reflection. So you see this uh, uh, the sharp feature, which is this uh, dark state. Um, one of the dark states uh, appears here as a dip, and from that we could actually estimate quite well the um, uh, the uh, decay rate uh, or the coherence uh, introduced by the uh, complex uh, part of the. Um, uh, eigenvalues, and uh, what we see is that um, the um, uh, resonant ensemble of qubits showed uh, the uh, um, the increase of the um, of the uh, uh, corresponding decay rate as shown on this picture. On this picture, so this is the uh, the brightest of the dark states, and the theory, uh, which is described also in this paper and also in other papers uh, published earlier. Uh, predicts the scaling uh, at the power n uh, to the three uh, for the brightest dark state. And this is interesting observation, which we observe uh, here in experiment. These are the crosses here, and triangles is the numerics, and the dashed line is actually the, uh, uh, the analytical treatment um, done by uh, Alexander Padubny uh, about this problem. So uh, basically here, this is the other uh, next, uh, next uh, um, duck state um, uh, next to it. And the same uh, type of um, um, approach actually uh, predicts the universal scaling for the, um, for the darkest of the duck states, which should go as uh, n in the power minus three. So I'm, I'm not discussing these details here. Actually, we don't have enough data to confirm that because we cannot really observe this darkest subradian state uh, for the reason that we are limited by the, um, um, by the uh, uh, intrinsic 
uh, the coherence of individual qubits themselves and not only by radiated decay. So we cannot really make um, measurements of the line widths, which is smaller than the, than the natural line widths of, of our qubits, which was corresponding to the characteristic uh, T1 time of the order of few microseconds. So um, this plot shows again the um, dependence of the uh, transmission. This is S12. Uh, by bringing qubits one by one into the resonance. And then you see here, the, this dark area here is this band gap, which appears in the um, transmission spectrum. And the crosses are the corresponding uh, predicted um, eigenvalues for the, uh, um, for the brightest mode. For this is the uh, uh, super radiant mode. And these are the sub radiant modes on the left. So for our particular array, uh, the uh, widths of this band gap is about twice uh, the, um, um, the width of the individual qubit line um, uh, limited by the radiation. And uh, for infinitely long array, um, the uh, theory predicts uh, the increase of up to 6.3. Uh, this is for particular chosen uh, distance between the qubits, which of course is uh, limited by the size of our, our sample here. So um, the next thing we could do, we could actually do many um, uh, interesting configurations of frequencies of qubits and measure the transmission or reflection. This is uh, this data measured in reflection again. Uh, you see the experiment and calculation on the right, experiment is on the left. So what we do here, we fix the frequency of seven qubits at this horizontal uh, black line, and then we, we move the frequency of the qubit, uh, of the eight qubit, um, uh, the, uh, through the, uh, this frequency, so we move it along this dashed line. And then as we move, uh, we measure the um, um, uh, reflection uh, coefficient uh, as to two, and you see that the minimum in the reflection, basically this is the, uh, uh, the appearance of the uh, transmission, um, is, uh, is shown by this uh, dark area, uh, dark blue area. Uh, we could actually see that uh, the uh, um, uh, the, the whole number of lines depends on the, uh, on the uh, detuning of this individual qubit uh, relative to the rest of the, uh, of the qubits in the array. And basically one can explain these features by uh, condo type uh, behavior where the uh, qubit sort of dresses the state of the array or other way around the, uh, the array dresses the state of the qubit. So basically the, uh, the interaction uh, here is uh, very strongly dependent on this, this detuning, but we have really nice agreement between theory, theory and experiment uh, in this kind of um, example here. Uh, next thing uh, we could, uh, of course, uh, this is all of a single photon manifold, so uh, all that can be explained also by classical uh, equations of motion. But uh, we are dealing really with two level systems and the first signature of uh, quantumness which we could have here is that we could increase the power and then see the saturation uh, of the band gap, um, of the gap of the um, transmission deep uh, which is introduced by one qubit. And then when we take uh, eight qubits on resonance, we see that actually not only single qubit saturates, but also the uh, array of eight qubits saturates, and basically the band gap disappears at a power which is significantly higher than the power of, of individual qubits. And here you see the comparison of the um, uh, transmission um, coefficient uh, uh, as a function of power. So you see the saturation comes at lower power for single qubit, and then for eight qubit, it's, it's actually significantly larger. So this is the, the first kind of signature that uh, uh, we, do have, we deal here with two level systems. Um, second uh, uh, quantum behavior, which, which is well known in atomic physics, is the observation uh, of the Otlaton splitting. And uh, that's uh, uh, what you could do uh, by uh, taking atoms uh, or any kind of uh, multi-level systems. So if you have uh, three levels uh, in your quantum system, then you could drive the transition between the first excited and the second, second excited state. And then uh, you can measure uh, the, uh, uh, the intensity of the probe tone, which is shown here. This is the transition between zero and one as a function of the uh, amplitude or power uh, of the uh, driving tone applied at the transition one, two. This is described in the rotating way, a frame by, uh, by this Hamiltonian here. And basically what it brings, uh, uh, the um, driving tone, um, dresses the uh, first excited state uh, with these two states, uh, with the splitting, uh, splitting between them omega c, which is proportional to the driving um, field amplitude. And uh, here you see the, um, in our example, when we don't derive our system, we see uh, a deepened transmission. Um, this is uh, shown here. So this low transmission is on the left, high transmission is on the right. So this is our band gap. And when we apply now the uh, control tone, uh, we basically see two peaks 
uh, we see the splitting of this uh, uh, first excited state of the ensemble. And here we could actually do it as a function of power. Um, this is shown here. So uh, we observe this, uh, um, the uh, um, dependence of the uh, transmission. As you see, this is the band gap, and then the band gap splits. And then in the middle of the band gap, we see the uh, a transmission window, which is controlled by, by the applied uh, microwave power. So the difference is omega c, the um, dis distance between the in frequency in between the uh, address states is actually shown by the distance between these two red dashed lines. Uh, and in theory, what we observe here is, is pretty similar. So um, this is invited question, what are those, uh, those things? Let me tell it right away. This is basically uh, uh, the, uh, we believe this is a signature that our qubits are not identical. So we could tune the transition between zero and one to the same frequency, but it does, doesn't mean that we could make uh, qubits ideally identical in their harmonicity. So we'll have slightly different transition between one and two. And that's uh, in the reason for having this kind of um, uh, multiplets, which you, which you observe here. So this was done with eight qubits. And uh, then um, uh, if we reduce the number of qubits, actually we could uh, take this uh, multiplets away. Now, um, when we uh, do the, uh, the autotone splitting, this is uh, now a picture of the dispersion in the array. So we see um, that uh, we have uh, the, uh, this very same poly polyritonic branches, so the lower branch and the upper branch. But here in the middle, uh, in the, between the two gaps, which we obtain under, um, under driving tone, uh, we have uh, the dispersion, which can be uh, seen in this middle uh, part of this figure. And this dispersion actually corresponds to a um, pretty flat band here. So this flat band uh, is characterized by this group velocity, which is d omega over dk, which is actually extremely low for the left picture. It increases if you go from left to the right, but uh, this is a, a kind of a feature which has been also used uh, in experiments with atoms to, to demonstrate um, slow light. So what we uh, decided to do then, we decided to play with this a little bit, and what we, we did uh, we took now seven qubits uh, just to avoid this extra multiplet, uh, which you see now is the picture is more uniform. Uh, it's very same picture uh, of the autoton uh, splitting, which we uh, already seen in the previous slides. And then uh, if you do the cut through this um, uh, various colored lines, so my point, or say, okay, it works. These are three lines, and these are three cuts corresponding to these lines. From these uh, cuts, we could measure the um, real and um, um, and um, imaginary part of the uh, reflection uh, from the array and, uh, excuse me, transmission from the array. And uh, then we uh, actually observe from the slope of the, um, of the, um, um, of the uh, complex, uh, complex um, transmission, we can observe from the face of an argument, we can observe, um, actually uh, calculate the uh, group velocity. So it's actually inversely proportional to the derivative uh, of, uh, of, the, um, of the plot, which is shown here by this dashed line. So from that, we can actually estimate um, how, um, uh, how large is the change of the um, velocity of uh, propagating electromagnetic waves. And this uh, actually uh, is done on this plot. So these are data now taken at different power. Uh, the crosses, uh, the, the blue crosses are experimental points. And then uh, the numerics gives the, um, uh, the orange line. And then there are two limits um, in the, um, uh, in the uh, theoretical calculation, which is given by this, uh, this formulas below, done again by Sasha Pandubny, um, showing the behavior for low power and for high power. And uh, basically the pulse delay, uh, or the, the group index, which we get here, is as large as uh, almost 2,000. So we can uh, go above uh, 1,500. Uh, mm, uh, slowing, slow, we, slow, we slow down the electromagnetic waves by uh, more than a factor of 1,000 here. So this is obtained from the, from the spectrum. So this looks uh, interesting, but maybe not enough convincing for experimentalists. And uh, we are such experimentalists that we really wanted to make sure that really we, we have it as, as we, we think. So we decided also to make the pulsed experiment. So we, we were then forming a pulse of the duration about 50 nanoseconds, and then sending the, this pulse and measuring the true delay of this pulse. And here you see what we have done uh, in, our, um, in our system. So this is the, the black pulse, is the initial pulse which we, we, uh, we have done with all the qubits um, um, uh, tuned away. So this is the conventional pulse propagation. And then um, on, the, on the right you see the pulses which were obtained at different powers. 
Now, one has to pay attention here that we cannot really go very close here to the, to the slowest light because our, excuse me, our pulse has a certain um, uh, uh, width in, in time. And if you do the Fourier transform, it means, means we also cover a certain range of frequency. So if you go to very small powers where the, um, the phase delay is the largest, there, uh, at that point, we will have this uh, kind of uh, array working as a filter. So we'll not get all the pulse propagating through. But um, if we do it in a reasonable kind of compromise between the width of this Gaussian pulse in time and the uh, steepness of the, uh, of the uh, group um, velocity in the, um, in the region of the enhanced transmission, basically we could, uh, we could have this, uh, these plots which you see here on the right. And then uh, the summary which I've already shown uh, previously is fully confirmed. Now again on this um, now summary plot, you see that we had the crosses this is the, uh, the uh, group index determined or pulse delay determined from uh, the spectroscopy where we measured this, uh, um, the, the phase of the uh, transmitted signal and uh, calculated the derivative in spectrum. And the uh, orange uh, triangles are essentially directly measured pulse delays. And with directly measured pulses, we see del delays of, uh, of uh, almost uh, 1,500, so the group index uh, up to 1,500 in time result experiments. So this is really in a very nice agreement. And uh, uh, basically this invites to, to use these arrays uh, for, for example, um, quantum memory. Though, of course, uh, one, for quantum memory, one really wants to have highly coherent qubits and uh, these qubits are artificial atoms. Uh, and these qubits are not more coherent than the qubits which we otherwise have uh, if they're not really limited by um, uh, by Purcell or similar um, uh, uh, effects uh, in their coherence. So with that, I would like to uh, conclude. So he, here you see this uh, the picture of, of Jan, who really done uh, all these experiments uh, very um, systematically from fabricating samples uh, to doing all the measurements and doing the uh, numerical calculations. And uh, his experiments have demonstrated fully controllable eight qubit metamaterial in a waveguide. Uh, we have observed uh, the tunable and saturate, uh, saturable uh, polaritonic band gap, uh, observed also the scaling of the, uh, of the decay of um, uh, uh, subradiant and superradiant modes. And uh, interesting enough, we also uh, find here um, the uh, capability of this one-dimensional array of qubits to slow down electromagnetic waves and show uh, a variety of quantum effects. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for the nice talk. We have time for questions. Um, very nice uh, work, I think. Um, how scalable is that? And um, is there a way to control the anharmonicity so that you can uh, you know, avoid the problem of the um, multiple, the multiplets? Well, I guess uh, for uh, controlling harmonicity, one would need to come with more controls for each qubit. And uh, this would really complicate the whole thing. And scalability, once we need to tune the frequency, well, we have done also experiment with tunable qubits up to 25 qubits. It's, it's a different experiment with the, with the cavity, which I didn't speak about today. So I think 25, maybe 50 uh, is doable. But on the other hand, we also see what is going on in this field. So now there are experimental tools to tune uh, quantum um, circuits with many qubits with complexity to roughly 100. So of course this capability also extends with the uh, growing, out, growing up um, know-how in the field. So I think there will be fundamentally interesting questions what you could do with let's say 100 qubits. I think it's, it's doable. But of course one has to, to have very good reason to do it because it really complicates the whole um, setup. All right, thank you. Uh, have you thought about going to uh, metamaterials with some kind of topological properties where you would be kind of more immune to these uh, small imperfections which are inherent to like the nanofabrication? Uh, you mean to make qubits more identical? No, no, to let's say to have some kind of, I don't know, like you have a chain for you to go to some kind of topological phase of your chain where in which you, have, you would have some gap or but which would be connected to the, 
to, topologi to topology of the chain. For example, we could have some SSH chain, for example, or in which the properties of the chain would be more immune to uh, fluctuations uh, of the individual component of the chain. Well, actually, uh, we have done exactly that uh, with non tunable qubits. We have done with this SSH uh, uh, simulation, uh, quantum simulator with 11 qubits. And uh, it works in spite of this order, but this was without tunable qubits. So this was basically using 11 qubits with alternating coupling. I and then we were able, that's a different paper which I didn't speak about today, <coughs> we were able to observe uh, also uh, localized edge states, not only for single photons, but also for doublons. So there is a robustness of, of this, uh, this type of uh, systems to a certain degree, but uh, really if you want to fine tune and resolve the uh, narrow lying uh, dark modes, I think there is no way that you could really do it with an uh, array with a uh, spread, which is typically, even if you do all the best for transmodes, I think it's hard to get uh, frequencies below, let's say, 3% spread. This is really difficult. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Alexei, for the nice, nice presentation. I understand that the goal is to make these qubits uh, more identical, but on the other hand, there is interesting physics when they are not identical. Yes. So, uh, for example, I mean, in the extreme case, where many of the arrays of these qubits, you may have Anderson localization. So, mm -hmm. is this, is there something that that you where you see signatures of this uh, of these effects? Yes, exactly. So, exactly with the same experiment, we have a paper in collaboration with uh, 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 Sasha Mirlin uh, group in, in Karlsruhe, where we looked uh, at the effect of disorder. Actually, we could, we could do a variety of things here. I didn't have time to speak about. We could make, for example, the dispersion engineering by making the two clusters of qubits, and then we get a very similar steepness of the, of the, phase, of the group velocity which makes it possible to make slow light, not by automatons, but by just um, dispersion engineering. And uh, we, we basically were able to observe signatures which were similar to, the, to, the, um, to, to, to localization uh, by introducing different degrees of disorder. And this paper actually just appeared in Physical Review A, um, I think it's the end of last year, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can go. Uh, thank you, very, very nice talk, I'm very glad to see that. Now we have uh, more and more control on many more uh, qubits. I, I would have a question about the, the quantum net. I believe it was slide uh, 19, when you look at this power dependence. Um, I am, did you, because if I am correct, this um, sub region state is at seven, on, on the right plot, is, is at 7.89 uh, gigahertz, right? So yes. what would happen uh, there? Because the, the orange line is like in, 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 in a, in a this is the radiant state, but what would happen for the sub radiant state as a power dependence? And do you expect something very peculiar there? Maybe I didn't get your, your question quite. Uh, uh, so, so if, if you look at the power dependence yes. at 7.89, yeah. uh, what do you observe? In this, is, this is the, um, the uh, um, feature corresponding to one of the sub radiant states. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And what, is there any. I mean, what would be the, the, the power dependence of that, or what would be the quantumness, as you, as you said, of this sub state? Well, we didn't really um, study that. I think we have also not done uh, systematic numerical simulations for that. But uh, it's interesting why the state saturates uh, earlier mm -hmm. than the other state. Um, I believe uh, if you, uh, I mean, intuitively, if you have uh, the sub state, that means that actually the qubits are not oscillating in phase. Mm -hmm. So with the same kind of field which it drives them, they tend to do different uh, type of, uh, of motion. So they basically not do it like this, but they start doing like this. And uh, harder you drive, um, sort of uh, less promote, you, 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 you less promote the state mm -hmm. uh, to exist. So I think it's more fragile and um, the saturation of the sub, uh, sub, uh, sub radiant state should naturally would occur before the saturation of the super radiant state. This is an uh, intuitive mm -hmm. picture, but we have not done any, any yeah. uh, calculations on that. Yeah, and then, because it's non-monotonic, obviously, here, and, and so you explain the, the why the, the first, uh, why it should uh, decrease, and then the fact that it goes up again is just that you kill all the qubits, or, I mean, again, if we speak about uh, well, waving physics. I think this is where you basically have uh, still a uh, robust uh, survival of uh -huh. the uh, of the bright bright state. Okay. And this is uh, where the dark state is sort of eaten up by the, by the bright because you drive oh. it very hard. Okay. 
Uh, the uh, asymmetry that you observe this slope here is uh, due to the uh, um, not ideal Lorentzian, which we also have for a single uh, qubit. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and that's uh, it's a feature that it's not really um, ideally coupled, so to say, in symmetric way. It has a kind of condor type uh, uh, resonance shape. Okay. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other question? Uh, if not, we thank the speaker and all the speakers. I mean, <laughs>